Hi there. Thursday, December 14, 2023. Welcome to the Fourth Watch. And finally, the first episode of Jesus and Beers at a time when kings went off to war. Fifteen months ago, 50 men gathered to have church at a gun range in Seattle, Washington. Listen, if this already bothers you, you better buckle up because we're going to get even further. You see, there's a time when men have to gather. Revelation 1, 6 refers to all of us as kings and priests to God, which means our kingship, our cultural, civic responsibility, as well as our priesthood, which is our responsibility before God to lead ourselves, our families, and our communities in faith. This is a time, above all times, when men need to gather Cut the fat and clear the air about what's happening. I need to speak to my mission as the Holy Spirit has laid it upon me. I didn't have permission to release this footage until now. About a month ago, the Holy Spirit started stirring. About two weeks ago, he's like, listen, guy, get it done. Get it out there. So this is where we are. If you're out there and your spirit of religion or a critical spirit arises within you because you think we can't put the name Jesus next to beers, there's a God I wish you knew. My mission is to stir the men into action in places of spiritual preparedness where we are ready as watchmen and gatekeepers for the faith, for the community, for the family, for the children. If that bothers you, I don't know what to tell you. I'm still going to call it Jesus and beers. That's what the Holy Spirit put on my heart. This idea is seven years in the making. Around that time, I've had the fortunate honor of guarding pastors and their families with my life in a security capacity, and I have broken bread with several of them over the years, and it has been some of the most enriching conversation I've ever had regarding the faith. It's helped me and others reconcile several things that we questioned, that we pondered, that were heavy on us. And finally, without the pretense of the crowd, we have to go to people above us and people amongst us to hash these things out as men. And that's exactly what we did. It's exactly what we're going to do. There are future events scheduled. If you are suffering from addiction, from alcoholism, from abuse, I'm going to speak to your potential. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke those spirits that are afflicting you. I also call you to a state of discipline where you know you can't continue these things any further. I rebuke the effect of abuse that's happened on people, and I call you forward right now to watch this and see that men can gather under the banner of Jesus with beers in it, and his will will be done, not ours. Without further ado, Jesus and beers. At a time when kings went off to war. God, we thank you for your presence. We thank you that it's here, that your word says where two or more are gathered, there you are in our midst. The church has had years of a church body of believers that have been so comfortable and so sanitary and so so lukewarm. You gotta kill a lion, you gotta kill a wolf, you gotta do these things so that you have some individual capital. So that like even God has something to work with when he gives you an order, when he says go do this. Welcome to the Fourth Watch. First and foremost, I want to say thank you to everyone that came. Thank you to John Fowler, Security Gun Club, for hosting. But this is Jesus and Beers. Dave, you want to leave us in a prayer? Yeah, I'm happy to. God, we thank you for your presence. We thank you uh, that it's here, that your word says where two or more are gathered, there you are in our midst. And God, we thank you that you love men and you made men Mm -hmm. and you made Adam first, God. And from the clay, you formed him, God, and you breathed a breath into him, Lord, and you gave him life, God. Would you do that today? Would you breathe into us, Lord? Would you give us new life, Lord? Would you fill us with your presence in Jesus' name? Amen. Amen. All right, so I'm going to just hit it with a, hopefully the 60-second intro into what Jesus and Beers is. Five years ago, I'm sitting in a trailer in California desert in August, 115 outside, 108 inside, and AC busted. We're dirt biking. It's a pastor friend, another guy that was on the security team, and myself. And so basically, as I saw it, right, the pastor above had me in the middle just kind of poking the bears and talking trash. And then you had Chris on the lower end. We shot a lot. We probably went through, I think, Total was like 4,000 rounds mm-hmm. by the time in three days. So it's, you know, it's a little bit of shooting. I realized that in three days we had cut the fat and we had actually gotten to the heart of a lot of things that were happening individually. We talked corporately, we talked about like the church at large, what was going on. And it was actually cool because it wasn't like a bitch session. It wasn't like I'm gonna vent and just like crap on a pastor. It was like, we got to hear from him and mm-hmm. right and ask him questions. And we'd been guarding this guy, you know, for years. And so all mm-hmm. of a sudden it's like, okay, so if we were willing to lay down our life, as security volunteers so that your mission could continue. This is, this is brotherhood. And so it went from that to at my house. I hosted a couple gatherings where I actually had pastors and security myself. I'd cook a bunch of tri-tip and we'd stand around and just drink 
my scotch collection, <laughs> which is actually gone. Bye-bye. <clears throat> um, five hour conversations will go by. And so what, what happened was the veil was gone. There shouldn't have been a veil, right? There's a reason why the veil was torn from top to bottom. Mm-hmm. And so in my background and coming in from my father being a pastor and, and growing up around, you know, with the professional church, the corporate church, um, since I was a young child, I had no taste for it, no appetite for it. Mm-hmm. It wasn't to say it didn't have its place. There's a church. Ecclesia is one thing, but the corporate church as well. There's every person of every type of faith that needs an entry point, needs needs a processing facility, it needs a place to to hewn yourself and sharpen yourself amongst other people. What I just realized was pageantry. Mm-hmm. It was a perception of a thing, not the reality of a thing. Mm-hmm. A lot of showmanship, and again, like I don't I don't believe the church should have ever become a business, mm-hmm. and. It, it, it did, so we're here. I also believe that the church as a business is part of the book of Revelation being read out loud. Mm. And so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not disgruntled by it, I'm not angry. Like, there's no stupidest thing I've ever heard, church hurt. What is that? Like, what kind of victim-based- Right, right, like, thing. Yeah, like, <laughs> like, a, like, a, like the wokeism has like entered in. So long story short is, this was my hope. There is no veil, right? There's, there's just a bunch of dudes. At the end of the day, church should not just be the four walls. Shouldn't just, church shouldn't just be on Sunday. It's wherever you go, two or more. Like, what are you doing? What are you mm-hmm, discussing? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right? So the last de- decades, right? Since the 70s, 60s, we've been filling coliseums, idolizing everything else up and down. And what are we doing now? We're lost. Right. That, like, the, the men are gone. The men are not around to defend the faith, the house mm-hmm. worship, the family, fatherhood. Right? Anything. And so now, and I, I joked around about it in the shooting bay, but you've got 12 million something-ish gun owners, brand new gun owners that are women mm-hmm. over the last two years. Mm-hmm. To the point that women now even have to defend themselves physically because of, by virtue of a you know, thousand different cuts, the men aren't there. Yeah, mm-hmm. vacuum. Mm-hmm. But we're right here, right? So physically, we exist. Where are we mentally, emotionally? Where are we spiritually? This is why this has to happen. In all of our relationships, right? There needs to be someone above us, right? Someone below us. Not that we're looking down on, but like we need to be able to like hash out some things at a higher pay grade and at a respectable pay grade because honestly, we need to be balanced. Mm-hmm. If we get too much here, we're too lot, you know, high on our own supply. If we're too here, we're, we're lost in the, in the grass and the Weak. weeds, right? Yeah. So can we be in the throes of all of this? And so, gentlemen, I'm grateful. I'm going to give you a second to introduce yourself. But first and foremost, I just want to extend my thanks. It's been something that's heavy on my heart. And honestly, mm-hmm. I've, I've tried to do this at other churches. I even <laughs> joked around saying like, you know, I won't besmirch the good name of the church. We'll do it in the parking lot. Like, you know, <laughs> a little CD. They're like, ah, but it's our parking lot. <laughs> 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 somebody else. This is good. And I, I respect it. So first and foremost, praise God. The church has come this far, lasted mm-hmm. this long. It's brought us all here. Mm-hmm. And my sincere hope is that Every man came in a certain way that by the time we're done, we're gonna be sharpened and we're gonna actually leave different men. Mm. I think it's time. And I think honestly, if we don't step forward, like I said, the book of Revelation, I believe is being read out loud. And that leads us to really the theme, right? Revelation 1, 6, Jesus, his words are calling us kings and priests. Manhood and priesthood. We actually thrive and we push and we drive at our manhood. We are not driving at our priesthood, which means we're not spiritual. Mm-hmm. And not like vibey spiritual, right? Like I want to hunt down vibe and like take out its teeth and make a necklace. Like I don't get vibes, <laughs> right? What's spiritual? What is mm-hmm. spirit? The Holy Spirit is alive and well and active. Are we pursuing that? So at a time when kings went off to war, the Bible lays out an annual cycle of war for God-fearing men, for his men. Mm-hmm. They met in Rosh Hashanah. They met in Jerusalem, Rosh Hashanah. The kings gathered together and their, their closest allies and they prepared, they planned provision, training. They knew what they were going to have to do and and put together until the next year. And then when springtime came, at a time when kings went off to war. Mm -hmm. And where did did David find himself? Not at war. So that phrase is ingrained forever in our spiritual man. And so what have we done? We haven't been at war. I'm not saying we need to be like super Christian warrior, go to warrior (laughs) camps. It's like, listen, if you're a Christian, you're at war. You're you're already born behind enemy lines. Right. Mm. Right. So my hope for this is for every man to leave here again, sharper, stronger, better than he was when he came in. But you're a king and a priest. And this is the time when kings have to gather and prepare because, listen, I'm not trying to be prophetic. I'm not trying to tell you a line that you know is based off fear of conspiracy. But what's coming is coming for all of us. Mm-hmm. So is the church going to enter the season ahead on its feet or on its knees? Mm-hmm. That's up to us. That's good. That's all I got. Good. Woo. 
you know, my church happens to be called King's Church. <laughs> Serendipitously. Um, literally, the little K, that's the idea. It's not the King's Church, God as the King. Every other church, King's Church actually is called, like, God as the King. But the idea was that we have a duty to be kings and priests. It actually starts, the promise starts in Exodus. And then it's repeated a couple of times in Revelation. And the founding of the United States of America was this idea that there was a combination of priests and kings, and that's what made a righteous nation. The idea was that the citizens were the kings, that they were the sovereigns. That's why our constitution starts, we the people. And that the, the pastors were the priests that counseled the kings, the counselors to the kings. And if you had that combination that was rightly ordered, then you would have a righteous society. And so... Um, you know, the Scots came out with this uh, philosophy called you know, Rex Lex and Lex Rex. Rex Lex was the idea that king was above law. And they said, this is not God's idea. God's idea is that the kings subject themselves to God's law, to his order. That's how we start doing it right, is when we, we're, like, we're super off track. We have to look back at God's law and say, how does this work? And so Rutherford wrote this thing, Lex Rex, that Lex was on top, the, and the king was submitted to the law because it was God's divine mandate. And David doesn't do that. First Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 11. It says this. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this. It says, he's up on his roof but it says he gets off his couch and then goes out <laughs> and looks so it's like he's not only not at war mm. he's on a couch i think we're supposed to have stools here or something <laughs> i'm joking but you know it's like the yeah. idea was like it's like rest on top of rest it's like comfort on top of not only are you not at war but you're laying on your couch mm. and that's that's the caricature of the modern father the guy that's oh, yeah. attached, cool. you know, surgically to his couch, mm -hmm. surgically. He's living vicariously uh, uh, through the adventure of others, the pretend adventure of others. Right. And he's attached to his couch. And that brings absolute chaos to the kingdom of Israel. Look at the modern equivalent. We've normalized kids staring at screens. And so uh -huh. it's okay if daddy stares at a screen yes. too. Like, mm -hmm. no, none of it's okay. Yes. We're realizing that now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I have, a, I have a theory about that, but just a, in part... Like in the 1950s, we all decided nationally. And if you look at like, oh, people always talk about the 60s being the downturning of the United States. You hear that in churches all the time. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't start in the 60s. It starts before that. You just don't jump oh, off on. the cliff. That's oh, not wow. how it works. The summer of love in 1969 and all the insanity didn't just start in 1969. But in the 1950s, television proliferated in households. Secular messaging. The priests got removed from the home mm -hmm. and the moral lawgiver became a secular agent agent that was representing how the world works and we still live in a culture in a country today where most people that are quadruple masked are living that way because a secular lawgiver has been telling them how the world works yeah. and it's no longer a priest that counsels a king cool. it's guys that are surgically attached to their couches well I, I think that's kind of that's the issue man like where does the guy that's you know I don't know, like in my life, I've really been blessed, you know, like my father's been with me, you know, I've had an out of body experience and, you know, like he walked me through Iraq and like multiple IEDs and I have all this, all these things. I think the, the place where I want to just say, come on, man, stop asking for permission, which that might just be the answer is just, I feel like we need to give these guys a place to start, you know, um, a place to really start to realize that. I think what our world needs is masculine love, you know? And I, I, I look out at the world and it's like, man, how much is too much, you know? And the answer is as much as they can take, you know, it's as much as they can take from us before we actually stand up in like a spirit of love and say, hey, I'm a warrior and nothing, you're not gonna have access to anything else behind me. You're not gonna have influence in my home I will piss my wife off if I have to and all of her friends because in my house, this is not what's going to happen. And you know what? I'm accountable to God for that, mm -hmm. you know? And I feel like, you know, there's just no stinking shortcuts because that's what masculinity is about. You know, these rite of passages you see in the past where it's like, 
you go get taken away from the the environment that you were raised in where your mommy tells you you're special because that's her job. And then you go out with the men and everything starts to become performance driven. You've got to survive an ordeal. You got to survive on a little bit of food, water, shelter. You got to kill a lion. You got to kill a wolf. You got to do these things so that you have some individual capital. So that like even God has something to work with when he gives you an order. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. When he says, go do this, there's something for you to dig deep and find to go do it because it's going to be hard, you know? Um, and I feel like we as men have to realize it. We are going to have to fight an uphill battle, but our father rides to war with us and we need to stop asking permission yeah, from people around us because it's literally our job. If I got to tell my daughter to go back inside and put some longer pants on, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Oh, and wow. she going to be mad and I'm be like, Hey, it's an honor. But I love you. You know, I love you, you know? Yep. So yeah, I, I think, you know, and especially, you know, with me, I always try to give a, you know, it's not about the macho thing. It's not about how tough you are. It's about the power that you draw from your heavenly father and the spirit of love causing you to give masculine love which is discipline but that means you've got to have discipline in your life which is setting standards but that mm -hmm. means you've got to have standards in your mm -hmm. life and 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 which is challenging people to, to rise higher which is hey i love you but that's not good enough i know you can do better but you got to have that stuff first you know so i think it comes right back to where we're looking at david and we're like yo david man <laughs> you mm -hmm. know like you got to do these things for yourself otherwise we're like a ship without a rudder you know yep. maybe i i mean all, all i keep thinking though is and this all comes back and it's the same stuff as yeah. identity 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 identity, yeah, identity. because and, and and i think we get lost with this so often and i, I i'm gonna first state that i am a patriot i am a full-blooded patriot but i am a son of god first and i believe that often we get lost and forget that the destruction that we are feeling today is not even the last 50 60 years it's not the last 100 years this has been the the agenda of the enemy since genesis i mean since before that the nephilim agenda has been at work constantly and i think we we screwed that up when the formation of our constitution because we had strong men that knew who they were in their identity in christ and so they stood up for something and so we slowed this agenda and slowly it's been eroding because the enemy works lies into our minds as men because he doesn't have to do anything else he doesn't have to attack we we get lost in these symptomatic problems wanting to solve healthcare and education and politics and all these things when in reality those are just symptomatic problems of men that lost their identity and allowed for an opportunity for the, the enemy to come in and, and take over. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what we have to get back to is we can't even stand up in the way and own these things that we have been given as opportunities and tools until we know who we are. And I know some of us have talked about this, but this is, this is because we have believed the lie for so long that we're either not worthy or I can't do that because of this or whatever it is. And, and, and I, I remember the awakening for me, I, I, am, I am the walking embodiment of grace because of legacy yeah. that my father's father made a decision mm -hmm. to follow Christ. Mm -hmm. And now I get to, to live in that. Mm -hmm. But I, I remember years ago going to a men's conference with 2,500 men and they said, if you have wounds from your father, I want you to come forward. And 80% of the room walked forward. And I, I, I was heartbroken. I didn't know how to process that because that, that wasn't me. Mm -hmm. And I realized this is what we are living in because men have been wounded and lost their identity. And I, I, I believe that is what we're stepping into now mm -hmm. is we have to take hold of our identity in Christ so that we can then start to get to work in the call that God has given us. Mm -hmm. And I believe all of that plays into this. So... I had an absentee father, Pentecostal pastor, music minister, right? So he was in the throes of like trying to build a church. He's so focused on the business of the church. I didn't have daddy issues. We can call it masculine wounds, right? It's daddy issues. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that to knock it, right? I just, I need to simplify it and correlate it back to what has it historically been called. Mm -hmm. And so everyone's got some story. Everyone's got some sort of like thing with a thing. It's become to me the danger of identifying as that problem. Mm -hmm. It's like, what, how did we all of a sudden start identifying at scale as these things? And that's why I feel like 
our feelings have betrayed us to such a degree subversively. Mm -hmm. And we've been told to foster these feelings, foster them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're so important. Oh, it's 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 the victim of the year, yeah. You had a guest on your podcast. Mm -hmm. I memorized this and you can correct me if I'm wrong. He basically said the stages of society, you have a a warrior-based, nomadic-based society, right? So so nomadic warriors, you have to be fit, top of the food game. Like this is your survival, but it's also your kingship, Mm -hmm. okay? So then it goes to a dignified-based society where all of a sudden you actually get respect because of what you've done in the past, Mm. right? And then it goes to just a mutual respect society. So everyone just has Mm. uniform dignity. You're alive, you're given rights, everyone respects you. Mm. And it goes to a victim-based society and it goes to an Uber victim where everyone's trying to out-victimize, you know, that's their story, that's their nature. And so guess what happens? Reset. Yeah. Warrior class reemerges because what happens? Society falls. Right. Because it's untenable, because all of a sudden you're left with without justice, right? And this is what always, it's what kills me about Isaiah 59. And this is why it's been like one of the driving chapters of, of my entire life. The Lord looked and saw that there was no man and he wondered why there was no intercessor. Hmm. It enumerates a bunch of things that he does. And then what does he ultimately do? He puts on the cloak of vengeance. I'm sorry, like what, anytime the Bible uses very specific words, vernacular, and it chooses the words vengeance and God in the same sentence, it's not gonna go. It's gonna go horrible. <laughs> and, so I, and so I see these We're things, right? So it's like we've allowed, daddy issues and mommy issues and we haven't risen to these things and all of a sudden society finds out that it caters to these things and these mm. thoughts and we have to resolve it right there has to be resolution and what's the only resolution honestly as far as the season that we're in kings and priests yeah mm. it all of a sudden has to override because you're not going to resolve certain wounds you're not going to mm. have closure you're not going to get something talk about the degree within the group mm. psychologically if the closure is not coming and you don't seize hold of jesus and his grace and what he has to offer what do you do? You're in the throes <laughs> you of gotta enemy, fight right? wound. I mean, you, but the, you got to fight. You got to fight wounded. You know, like I feel like um, that's like part of the thing. Like I feel like, and and I agree with you 100. percent You know what I mean? But like this is the game, man. Like you're always gonna have an issue, man. You're always gonna have something you're challenged with. There is not a dude in this room that ain't fighting something. Let, you know, that, you know, there's just not. And so we have to learn how to use our tools no matter what our excuses are, no matter what they're trying to tell us our excuses are, like no matter what they're trying to tell us our identity. I mean, the the battle for identity right now is so huge. Mm -hmm. I I Googled uh, man and male the other day and there's Oxford Dictionary in there uh, and the definition was like a uh, term used for people irrespective of sex and age and i was like these guys are it's horrible but the quality of a society is is so much dictated by the quality of its of its males like the quality of what they believe it is to be a fully developed male and to serve from that place and so man that identity piece is huge but i think that fighting wounded is like just part of this game and you know what happens you stink and heal up on the way <laughs> you know what I mean? You right. heal up right. on the move, man. And and that, yeah. You know, we even got ahead of ourselves. Yeah. Name, occupation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, 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 I was going to say, I was gonna say that. I, I forgot. Uh, my name is David Englehart. I'm uh, in New York City. I'm a pastor. Um, and I have a law practice as well. I do federal litigation and uh, some business transactional stuff. I speak a little bit um, about kind of the cross section of politic and and our faith which fundamentally should be for the believer that the bible informs every part of your life Mm. there's no part where you don't get your marching orders from it um bad theologians uh, have have told us that there's some kind of separation between politics and religion it's nonsense it's Mm. lie from hell Mm -hmm. uh jesus talks about everything and so do we so um sometimes it gets us in trouble and we're happy when it does (laughs) <laughs> outstanding if you had something to say to your kids 20 years from now so you're here tonight you see where everything's headed you see that men are not on the field dressed and ready and clothed with christ picture your kids 20 years from now what are you saying to them you know i there's a there's a there's a um scripture in the new testament that says if our conscience does not condemn us basically it's a, it's, a, it's talking about standing before god and I think most guys walk around with a condemned conscience, and so they don't want to talk to God. They don't want to. They don't want to. They don't want to face God. Mm. I'd, I would tell my kids. I'd say, live honorably. 
That's what I would say to them. I'd say, be honorable. Because I don't care what they do. I don't care if they're rich or poor. And, and I don't know how God's going to use them because there's an, there's, an, there's an element of God's sovereignty in the calling. But if they, if they're, if they walk in honor, um, then they'll represent God well. They'll represent their name well. Yeah. The Ecclesiastes says, um, better, better is the, the, the day of a man's death than his birth. So first, before that, it says uh, a, a name is better than treasure. And then it says it's better the, uh, the day of a man's de uh, death and his birth because you don't know if his name was good until, until his that. death. Yeah. And uh, that's, what, that's my, my, what I want for my sons is to have great names. That's what I want. And if their names are great in a town of 600 people, mm. so be it and God bless it. Mm. If, they're, if their names are great in the nation, so be it and God bless it. But that, they, that they're men of honor. That's good. Character is the only thing that you take with you when you die. Your character before God, by the way, not before man. Mm -hmm. Aristotle says the magnanimous man receives honor from other men or reward or trophies from other men, but he doesn't want them or need them mm -hmm. because he's, he's fundamentally driven inside to be honorable before God. And so the reward doesn't matter. He gets it because he is honorable, but he doesn't care about it. Yeah. And that's incredible because there's like guys that enter the church just starting to get the God thing right. And they're like, man, if I could just get a trophy for this. Because when we're kids, we want trophies. We want mm -hmm. validation from dad. We want this kind of stuff. But when you, when you get past that level, you say, I'm doing it before God alone. If no one sees it and I die, so be it. Mm -hmm. More glorious, as a matter of fact, yeah. if Amen. no one sees it. Yeah. yeah that's, um, there are things that are written in heaven. Honestly, it doesn't matter if they're written here. Yep. Everything, yep. everything that's written here is going to be washed away anyways. Mm -hmm. And so the reality is like, that's, that becomes ethos, that becomes code. Mm -hmm. And so um, from a legacy perspective, that's exactly what you want to pass mm -hmm. down. Byron Rogers. <laughs> um, well, my background is I'm more, you know, not a pastor. Um, I'm a veteran. Um, I racked twice, um, you know near-death experience, got to pray, got a second chance on life. So I, um, second, third, fourth chance on life. So I live life really from the space that I absolutely will not let the grace that's been given to me be in vain. And that is like a stinking superpower, man. That's really what I lean into. Um, I've been a professional protector for about, you know, the last 15 years, I've operated in over 60 different countries. Most of that work's been in uh, the body of Christ, protecting, you know, evangelists and, and pastors and Christians. I've seen the inside of thousands of churches and gotten to realize, you know, see the real and the business of it all. Um, you know, got a few podcasts and things like that. But, you know, growing up in church, I just didn't see a lot of real men I could look up to, you know. And so I think... And I see the hole, the void, the chink in our armor and like the vulnerability that it leaves in the body of Christ. You know, that when we are literally, we are the, 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 the roof on the house, you know, and I grew up in a house without a father, you know, and I looked for masculine leadership in my church, you know, and I found a lot of nice guys but that just wasn't the brand. That wasn't what I needed. That wasn't my path. That wasn't where I was going. And so I've always really had a heart for seeing men, real men in church. There's nothing wrong with being a nice guy. Mm, maybe there is, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, we should be nice guys, you know? Hey, I need guy, guys with ears, ear necklaces are some of the <laughs> nicest guys, you know, there's, that's a sign of actual All day long. <laughs> nicest guys, you know, <laughs> you would <laughs> never think you'd bump into them in Albertsons and like, you know, <laughs> yeah, tell them, yeah, but you have no idea what these men have done, you know, but you know, I, I, I believe there's, there's some strong, powerful masculinity that we, we desperately need. Yeah, and so that's really why I'm here. And I, I think my service to the body of Christ at this time um, might not be a pastoral one, but might be more of uh, the warrior calling. So one of the other companies that I do, one of the other things I do is I train protectors. I believe protectors are the white blood cells in the body of humanity. And so my, my goal, you know, what I believe God's got me here to do is make the world a safer place by making good people more dangerous. And Come so that's on. what I live Come for, man. On. You know, so, you know, we have I huge training events and we stink and get after it, man. But to answer your question, man, I was thinking about this 20, this 20 years from now, what I tell my kids, man, I, I, I honestly would tell them, um, 
you know, whenever I die, I just want the world to see what one imperfect man can do if he just gives his best on the altar, you know, uh, that what his heavenly father can do with one imperfect dude, man, like that's what I want him to see. And so I would tell, I'd tell my kids, go, yeah. like go, know that you're loved. And that if you just know that if you've got God with you and it, you're loved and go, and no matter what, you know, let him perfect you on the stinking path. You know, don't accept other people's judgments. Look in the mirror, be harder on yourself than anyone else can be on you, you know, and, but just know that you're loved, you're supported and you're perfected as you take action on faith. Like faith without works is dead. It's impossible to please a father without faith. You got to get into action and you will learn and become by the grace of God. Like just don't have fear, you know, fear, letting this life that's been given to you be in vain because it's a stinking miracle. By the way, so the, the room it, knows he's a girl dad. Right? <laughs> so, so that's not like, that's not like a message to just like a young, you know, yeah, Byron yeah, that's, a, that's about to murder everyone, you know, just, just <laughs> murk everyone. Congratulations. Yeah, thanks. Brand new boy dad. Yeah, let's go. Come on. I'm a little more test, a little more godly testosterone. Thank God. Jeez. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Kenny Stivers uh, have been girl dad for six years and finally got the blessing of new yeah. title of, of boy dad six days ago six days wow. ago. Yeah. Awesome. um i don't have a podcast i wasn't wasn't military <laughs> but uh also blessed by the grace of god i mentioned that a little bit but um marketplace uh i've grown up a believer i feel like i've been blessed to get my eyes opened in the last few years to to the true battle that we're in mm. and uh i have the privilege of getting to to lead our men at hope village church getting to be part of a a local church here that is awakened and speaking truth and not living in any sort of fear or what the world is telling us to to believe and preach which is a blessing in itself especially in this region um and and getting to actually understand the impact of what the marketplace is going to play in this next season of where we're headed. Um, uh, I mean, as a country, but definitely in the world uh, that that I believe this next wave of how we are going to take territory back that has been given up for so long is going to take uh, place in the marketplace, specifically get to be part of uh, the blockchain world and and what's taking place uh, on the digital front and uh, where we're headed. And uh yeah, I, I'm I'm excited to be here. I'm in, in a class of of warriors right now. So, right. no, and honestly, what's cool about just what I've seen, like God's hand is on you. You're embarking to build a men's ministry. You're in the most target-rich environment in all of human history. It's true. Throughout the course of this, my hope is that you'll be speaking to your equivalents. Mm. You know, those that are actually also on the front lines, and also for the men. Like, what do the men have to look forward to by going? What's that experience could be like? And, the spirit that's on you, it needs to be on other men leading. I have a theory, by the way, right? <laughs> by the way. By the way. Just, just one <laughs> Let me of just many. drop this on you real quick. So the youth leaders need to be the baddest dude at church. Yeah, man, I'm down. Please. I'm down. Please. The baddest. Let's, I mean, I mean, let's I mean, awaken alpha. some new youth leaders. We, we, Please, we, God. We need to get like the pugil sticks out and like the dads <laughs> need to like have a, have a go at you. Like, all right, all right, young man, let's go. That would oh, minister, man. bro. That would get it done. <laughs> yeah, right. That'd you want to, you want to. Force out the weakness yeah. of, of the. Uh -huh. Why? Because what are our youth walking into? Yeah. yeah. The most target rich environment of yeah. all, you know, mm -hmm. demonic activity that we could possibly find. And, and so you don't even have youth that know, like, rebuke it. Mm -hmm. Rebuke what? Yeah. What do I. What? They're not spiritual. And the world is just as happy as it can be, and, like, not let them be spiritual. Right. And so that's a whole separate thing. But no, dude, you're a bad dude. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. That's valuable. I love that theory. That man. is good because it's it's an it's a signal that's almost impossible to fake, and it has authority mm. in our physical realm. Like, yeah. you know, you when you walk into a room and you see the little the the younger dude like sizing you up, like he's literally like, "Can I follow this dude?" Like, yeah. you know, yeah. like is this dude? There's, that's, that's it's not I everything. Want. But I want a dude to be like looking over himself because all of a sudden it's like, hey, I'm, I'm, it is. It is. I'm Tim. I'm leading youth yeah. group, and all of a sudden like he like looks down at your daughter like, "Hi, I'm Tim," and he looks up at you and like shit <laughs> mm. you want him to have a little flinch like by the way 
we love Jesus, but we cuss, right? Like, I'm not saying, like, just, like, start dropping it, right? Like, we love Jesus, but we drink a little. No one's getting sloshed tonight, by the way. I didn't even, like, have, I had this whole opening monologue of, like, hey, like no, no one get just shit-faced tonight, please. I'm down. I got his back. And I'm looking around, too, like, like who's like, that guy? Crazy who's that guy? Who's the guy? Who's the like, one? Had a, had a hard, like, day. And Everybody's gonna... drinking tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the camera goes off, you know. Oh, man. Everyone's squeaking the quad. Everyone's, like, on the best. everywhere. Oh, man, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> We're in a gun range, by the way. Like, God, yeah. like, There's like, like guns all in the next room. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Rolled for the next room. That's where we're going right. next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I'll, I'll say this, though. I think, I think uh, it, it keeps on coming to this, but I believe... Actually, I'm going to back up. Two days ago, I had a conversation that got me all fired up. All fired up. Oh. I know. I, I heard this, this statement, and it was said multiple times. I just... I feel... I feel like things are coming back you know like i feel like there's so much hope and and here's the thing and i'm going to say this because i have never been more encouraged i believe god has awakened people and and shed the veil off of so many people's eyes and this is not a a regional thing this is all over the world there is an awakening taking place but we are on the cruise ship of cruise ships a boat so big as a church that is moving and retreating. And people are like, oh no, I feel like we're taken back. My opinion is we've hardly slowed down. It, it's still, it is still heading in such a, a dark place. And that doesn't discourage me. That I don't get scared about that. I get so excited because there is a very specific group of people that are being awakened for a very specific reason. And and this boat will turn around, but it's it's going to take so much more work. And right now, to your point, there we are not called to go get on a platform. We are called to use our platform to raise up other platforms. Mm. We are we are called to the spirit that has been given and by the grace of God been put on our lives. There is one commission that we've been given, and that is to go fire up other people and and awaken them to what it's, it's going to take. Because the church has had two years of a, a, a church body of, of believers that have been so comfortable sanitary. and so sanitary and mm -hmm. so so lukewarm mm -hmm. that now that the church is getting a little bit of freedom back because we felt so much persecution over that the last two and a half years, back. right? Yeah. <laughs> that now, thank, here's, you, thank you, sir. Here's yeah. what's <laughs> happening. Yeah, right. We're back to comfort. And guess what? Oh, we're going to see a lot, a lot of believers that are, that are believers that are, are going to be very upset because... Churches are going to start waking up. There's a few churches that are waking up and they're speaking truth again and they're speaking the gospel and they're going, no longer can we sit back and be silent. And this is not battling these, these outlandish, you know, secondary and tertiary issues. Right. This is attacking the, the main issue, which is people need to know Jesus. And they're actually speaking bold and truth and they're not being led by the lies or the, the, the things that are being fed to them of the world. And people are, are church hopping. They're, they're looking for the church that they are not gonna be felled, uh, or made, made to feel Challenged. uncomfortable. Yeah. Challenged, mm -hmm. they're not, they don't wanna, they don't wanna bring on discipline right. in their life. Mm -hmm. No, I don't wanna be, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm comfortable like, yeah, I want the altar calls, but I don't, I don't wanna actually be cut that deep. Mm -hmm. Don't offend me. Yeah. I mean, yeah. my goodness, don't offend me. And so I believe, I believe this boat of a church that we are on like a Cadillac, I, a, 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 a big, like a '60s Cadillac, is <laughs> is slowing, maybe a knot, but it's going to take a lot to turn that thing around. And I think that is the mantle that we are being given to steward now, which is to understand: no longer can we just be be soft. We do have to be loving, and but it has to be but a masculine firm. love. Yeah. It has to be a true godly love and that that looks very different and i i believe we're going to be called into some very tough times in the next few years and that's why we were built to take the wounds we yep. were built to take the licks mm -hmm. and for whatever reason our world is telling us to no, no. be careful don't get in the fight mm -hmm. so when you ask me like my kids yeah. i got one i have now had a a, a new awakening to what we're actually living in this I've, mm. I've grown up knowing the spiritual battle my entire life but i've never gotten to see it the way that i see it now so now it's 
I have one thing 20 years from now that I want to say, which is just get in the fight. Yeah. That's it. I just want to make sure my kids are in the fight. I want them to know that the only thing the enemy is going to do is try and take them out of the fight. Mm -hmm. So it's my only job as a, as a, a dad is to raise them in the true identity of Christ. Mm -hmm. Because if they know who they are, yep. they know yeah. what it means to be truly loved. Mm -hmm. They know what it means to live in grace. Then they will have the ability to get in the fight. Because if mm -hmm. I don't do that, if I don't understand my role as a father, then eventually they will be so far off their identity that then when they need to get in the fight, they won't have anything. There's, there's, there's no skill there. There's nothing yeah, there's there. There's no skill there. And I joke around and I call it revival on the way down, right? <laughs> because it's like, it was like, we're going to have revival on the way. It's like, okay, so you have the perception of a thriving church, thriving social media, big bank accounts, and dead cities. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, it's everywhere. And so you've got these little like pockets of things, right? And so it's not to say that the, the spirit of the church is dead. That's not the case. That's not where we're at. It's just how we're engaging it, how we're leading the church, how we're speaking to the church, how we're actually equipping and mobilizing. But there has to, there has to be mobility along with it, right? Yeah, yeah. And so not with rigidity. I always joke around and say like the sword of the Lord comes from the loving hands and feet. Like you have to spend mm -hmm. a season here and then actually end up like, oh my gosh, like I actually do have a little more hatred in my gas tank. Righteous indignation, hatred, but right. even human hatred. Yeah. Right? It's so good. it's like be angry and don't sin. Everyone puts baby in the corner. Oh, you're mad? Just go deal with it. Right. It's like, yeah. why, can't, why can't you weaponize it? Yeah. Why mm -hmm. can't you all of a sudden brush up against Matthew 11, 12, have some violent prayer, go out, yell it out, and all of a sudden you're like, hey, I feel better. Hey, babe, what's going on? You want some <laughs> dinner? You want some food? What about, hey, everything cool? Kids, let's go play. And it was like, were you just yelling? It's like, oh, like, yeah, yeah, I did that. Yeah. And? Like, like all of a sudden we've even taken away, like we can't even be mad or angry mm -hmm. at something mm -hmm. from a sense of six things the Lord hates, yet seven are abomination mm -hmm. to him. So we have the nature of God wired within us, which is also why I feel like the patriotic American is the Old Testament heart of God. Mm -hmm. And the Pentecostal spirit-filled American is the New Testament heart of God. What would actually happen if both those sides of God's heart yeah. came together? Yep. Mm -hmm. We're going to walk into the next season ahead on our feet instead of on our knees. Mm -hmm. So and everything's, everything's set stage-wise is that we're actually going to try and like limp our way forward. I'm like, hell no. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not the case. Yeah, man. And I think on that, what you're saying about, you know, like having something inside you and being able to lean into that and, and um, cultivating that uh, inside of yourself. I think that this asking permission and this softness, I actually think it's evil because you got to think like you're the backstop, like you're the backbone in these environments, like you're the backbone. And if you can just be quieted enough to not speak up, to not stand up, just enough to just, you don't want to upset, you know, like, and you feel it. I feel like every man feels it to the core of his mm -hmm, soul mm -hmm. every time. And it's not like, like, even sometimes I do it, you know, like, you know, there's a decision going on, da, 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 da. You know, the wife wants this and I'm like, ah, okay, you know, like whatever. But then I think about it in retrospect. I'm like, bruh, <laughs> you yep, know, like yep. you missed it right there. You should have said this, this, and this. It's, it's, you know, and that comes out of your identity. Like these decisions matter. Everything is my responsibility. And I can't, I have to take responsibility for everything because that's what we were literally designed for. You know, like he walks in the garden of Eden. He's like, yo, Adam, what's up, bro? Mm. <laughs> what went down, Adam? You know, and, and I can't say that woman you sent me. <laughs> that woman, even though that's Adam probably didn't idea. stand a chance, that's the first pair of titties he ever seen in his entire life. I don't know, fuck it. I mean, we got beers in the house, right? Oh my <laughs> but goodness. you know, I'm just saying, man. God bless him. It's true. And, and, and listen, true. That's a true. Order right by, there. by the way, to the young men that are in this room, yeah. listen. Here's the reality: once you've seen one pair, you want to see them all. That's just not how it just it goes. Okay, so like, <laughs> keep it keep it in check. And Lord yeah. knows, you're like, not it's weird. Everywhere. Just good luck. So man. I signed up for TikTok, right? Mm. And all of a sudden, like, I don't care what I open up that thing. There's a pair boobs in front of my eyes yeah, like every that. you start scrolling you're like okay thanks, thanks god thanks mm -hmm. thanks so we're gonna just start uh you know spread the word and just uh put up some videos yeah. in this <laughs> thanks god and so if, that, if that's me looking at it like really mm. uh, and kids are like oh my gosh oh yeah really? especially I mean, like young men in whatever puberty they have left yeah there was a uh i was i was talking on pastor a couple of weeks ago he said he's got a big church in uh, orange county he said that there was a 13 year old boy uh, was feeling sick and so we went to the hospital and uh doctor came out said to the parents i need you to sit down and 
parents they're like what's wrong he's like they're like we, we're, we're sorry to tell you this but your son's been sexually active and they're like no he hasn't no he hasn't mm -hmm. and they're like he's been on grinder for the last two years having sex with men and his body is riddled with aids and he's going to die oh my goodness because of the power of that of that device and we have i mean just just swaths of moron parents that are like that wouldn't be my kid my kid would never do that yeah. my kid would never do that like all our all these kids are walking around with, with not just like not not 50s porn magazines in their yeah. pocket mm -hmm. not their dad's stash they found yeah no 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 no, no. <laughs> no the, the 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 most insane stuff that the human mind can possibly conceive right that's on display in every locker room and every school yeah. across America yep. every day. And uh, my boys and I started doing this thing. We call it Dead Men's Talk. It's from a book uh, called uh, Raising Coal that every, every father must read. Um, and the father says to his son, Cole, when he's a little boy, uh, you can tell me anything. We're doing Dead Men's Talk. And I'm not allowed to even respond to you. You can tell me anything you've done. You can tell me if you're mad at me, you can tell me anything and I'm not even allowed to say a word to you until Dead Men's Talk is over and then I'm not ever allowed to even talk about what you said during this time. There is, it's, it's kind of like almost like confession and repentance. It's kind of like if we had God, if kind of kind of like was God was real and we could confess to him and he wouldn't lightning bolt us in the head every time we confessed. <laughs> but most of us, our fathers, if we ever said anything on the line, like, you know, hell is coming down upon our heads. So sin gets hidden and where it's hidden, it proliferates. Mm. I'm talking to my boy, he's like nine years old, eight, nine years old. I'm like, buddy, we're doing it. I'm getting started young, doing dead men's talk. He's eight, nine, he's got nothing to talk about, right? Yeah. And he says, I say, okay, bud, I'm not gonna say anything you can say. I, I thought he was gonna say, I'm mad, at, I'm mad at you, dad, because you yell too much or something like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He said, Dad, I was on uh, video the video games. I was on Xbox, and I'm playing Roblox, which is a kid's game. And I was in Roblox, and I went into a room. So in this game, Roblox, this universe, there's all of these mini games that are made by human beings. I went on this in this game, and everyone was having sex with each other inside of this game. And they were saying the most graphic sexual things. I'm translating what he told me. And he said, and I, he, I, I went to my room, and I... I took your laptop and I started looking on YouTube to find what this was about. And he wept and wept. And then we did it like a month later, same thing. And he wept and he wept. We did it probably, probably three or four times. And he had to get it out of his, he had to get it out of his heart. He had to confess. Scripture says, if we confess our sins to God, he's faithful to just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us for unrighteousness. But it also says, confess your sins one to another that you may be healed. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of guys that are forgiven, but not healed. We have a lot of guys that God has forgiven, but they still walk in bondage and they want someone to weep to. Because God puts this barrier, a protective barrier of shame around sexuality. Yep because it's so important, because it's actually about the creating of eternal lives. It's, it's massively important. And that's why it's there. And it's, got, it has, it's a protective agent, but- This phrase that you, you've said before though, sexual anarchy. Yeah, yeah, sexual anarchy. Anything outside the bounds of God's sexual order. What's God's sexual order? Man and wife, together forever, <sighs> having a blast together, having a sexual blast party. Two people only, two per two person party, man and wife. <laughs> Got to clarify that these days. And anything outside of that brings tragedy and chaos and shame and destroys the world. And we have most pastors in most churches in America that are too cowardly to even mention it on a Sunday morning. To even mention it, I was going through Sodom and Gomorrah a couple of years ago. Spent three three weeks in Sodom and Gomorrah. Fun place to hang out on a Sunday morning. Thinking this is not going to grow my church. Good. Um, I called a buddy who's got a big church in California. I was telling him about it because God was showing me all this really cool stuff in that, in that city. And he's like, I can't believe you would talk about homosexuality on a Sunday morning. I'm like, this is why our country is going to hell. Yeah. Yeah. This is why our Christians are going to hell because the fathers, the pastors, the protective agents have laid down their swords yep. and they're talking about how to fix your car and your finances and your marriage. Why are they doing that? Growth. 
our metric, our primary metric in the church is growth. And it's money, numbers profit. and money. Yeah. Yeah. And so in Laodicea, the, 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 cha the, the Revelation chapter three, where God says, I'm going to blot your name out of the book, those guys, he says to Laodicea, you're rich and you have no need of anything. You think you're rich, but you're poor and wretched and miserable and blind and naked. Mm -hmm. Buy from me gold refined in the fire, which means go through the pain of the fire. And he says, if you do, you'll sit on my father's throne with me. The people that are in the worst position, the, 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 the trashiest church of the book, get promised the throne if they'll reckon with their own sin and death that they're walking in. Because it because of money, but because that, but like God's trying to redeem their potential. Yes, exactly. Right. And so, like every man in this room is born with potential. Yeah. And so the fight, the furnace, the refinement, yes. right? And this is what's funny too. So about Sodom and Gomorrah, what did the people say to Lot? Right? They said, "You're the man that judges us." He spoke up. Mm -hmm. What has the church not done? Spoke yeah. up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what, what is it allowed men to do? Don't speak up. Oh, we're not speaking up. As long as you're a good member tither, as long as, you're, as long as you check the box, guess what? Everyone's happy. The, 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 the wife is happy because the kids got dressed up and went to Sunday school, checked the box, and went to, the kids are happy because they got you know, Chuck E. Cheese or like you know, some sort of pizza Cafe party. Kids, yeah. And so all of a sudden, and like the dad's like, oh, I'm dad of the day, right? Dad of the week. And all of a sudden, what happened? Pastor became the only priest in that person's life, and he's the pastor six days a week. The dad, the father. That's right. He mm -hmm. should have been the pastor right. and said like, oh, I'm actually supposed to be driving my family's That's faith. That's right. Yeah. The other thing, it's, it's, it's money and people. It's the metrics are success. Mm -hmm. And for the church, the metrics are supposed to be Christ likeness. They're not supposed to be numbers. Right. The, yeah. the movement for the last 20 years has been about numbers and we've got numbers, baby. Mm. Like we can pack them in. We got churches of 30 and 40,000. You guys listen to those guys ever on a Sunday? God forbid that you do. Mm. <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually talking painful. About Joel of the world. I'm talking about the guys that are uh, somebody said, David, who do you listen to these days? I said, no one. Why would I listen to a pastor leading the nation when the nation's going to hell? When, we're when, when divorce is skyrocketing? When our kids don't know if they're boys or girls? Why would I listen to those pastors? Mm -hmm. You listen to the pastors that changed the world, like Wesley. Those guys changed the entire world. Yeah. England, Jack the Ripper, prostitutes, people having sex in parks in public. We think, it was bad. We think it's bad now. We always think it's like the worst now. England was horrific. Wesley came in and said, oh yeah, by the way, you're going to hell, church, P.S. People are like, really? He's like, yeah, seriously. And he they revolutionized the world. The Calvinists hate him because they want to tell all of us it's okay, we can do whatever we want. We can't, we can't do whatever we want. Yeah. But what does that also say though, is that they knew the message that was gonna work. And here's what I'm gonna introduce into this. So the church is very quick to say there's evil outside, right? Not as quick to say you're evil. Right yeah. before that, yes. you, you reconcile yes. with Christ. You were at you were an enemy of Christ. Yes. Okay. So what does God do? He hates his enemies. Okay. So fact that in, and then there are actual people walking around the opposite you, the opposite David, the opposite Byron, the opposite Kenny. Right. That's trying to usher in the Antichrist. There is a worker of iniquity that knows all about Christ, all about our God, and is choosing to serve another master, not just serve, but serve him well. And what are we doing? We can barely check a box. We can barely fight our way prayer way, you know, prayer wise, mm -hmm. spiritual warfare out of a wet paper bag. I would go and tell men, right? What are you actually declaring over your life? And prop what do you mean declaring? You're declaring things over your life and your yep. family, right? Yep. So you've built a spiritual hedge around your family. You're maintaining it. You and mm -hmm. your wife, right? She's the, the spiritual neck that turns the head and points your attention. What? What? What do I have to say? <laughs> you don't have to say anything. You get to. Yeah. Mm. If Christ died to restore our authority and our dominion and we, we just want nothing to do with it, that's on us. Mm. If every man in here can't rise to some measure of violent prayer, all these things are pissing you off and making you angry. What do you do with it? Most, <laughs> a lot of people, yeah. All of a sudden, if there's no vehicle for that, the Bible has given us every single vehicle we need mm -hmm. for, for the weight and the gravity that actually starts to well up and, and dry. You know, all of a sudden, we've got this, this, this magma that's flowing up. Oh, no, it's great. You're great. Just mm -hmm. love people. Love mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I serve the Lord of mm -hmm. war, the mm -hmm. Lord of angel armies, Jehovah Sabaoth. And you're telling mm -hmm. just love? Like, do you not? And this is, this is the kicker, John. This, we've talked about this at length, right? We are so high on a supply of love, right? As God is love and not God is Lord. Lord means boss. 
If you cannot reconcile that, that means that this book is actually instruction. It's not just data that you can process, it's directive for, for, the, for the techie people in here, right? Mm-hmm. So you can process, everyone thinks, oh, I'll just process the data. It's just, you no, know, it's, it's directive. Mm-hmm. Oh no, not for me. My pastor didn't say that. My pastor didn't tell me that. I guess what? You're the pastor. Mm-hmm. Your, mm-hmm. Your, your God tells you this is directive and we get a pass. And the pastor's a, the pastor's a supplement. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. the pastor, like your, a, your church Sunday, a church. that's a freaking a, supplement. A counselor. That's like one of your counselors. Exactly, one of your counselors. But you're supposed to be getting your daily bread and walking with your father and leaning on him. And like, you know, he's supposed to be leading you and guiding you, man. You know, and then you submit to some leadership and a body and some accountability and you keep the rails on that way. But yeah. Monday through Friday, man, it's, you know, that's, that's our walk. Yeah. On the love thing though, like a yeah. loving, a loving cancer doctor cuts you open and and cuts the cancer out. Yeah, of you. I was gonna, it's yeah, not like, yeah. I'm just going to hug it out. It's going to hug that stage four right out of you. As yeah. you die. No, yeah. no. Yeah. Slices you open and yeah. pulls it out. Cuts you he, he didn't yep. just use the essential oils yeah. and like, the- <laughs> <laughs> well, on, on that too, I mean, like <laughs> we fight, you know, like the warrior is fueled by love, man. Yeah. Like that, those people behind me, that's the reason I'm going to, I, yeah. someone walks in here with a shotgun right now. The reason I'm like spin towards the door is cause I'd be danged if anything happens to any of you guys, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, not Why do you think I'm, I'm watching the door right now, I bro? Know, you, guys? you guys got the good <laughs> seats, man. I, I feel comfortable, you know, but I mean, that's the stuff that, you know, the world doesn't that, understand that brand of love, man. The world doesn't yeah. understand. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to die right mm-hmm. for the heathen as much as for the christian yeah that's true like, like if you're in the throes of, of homosexuality of depravity mm-hmm. like wherever mm-hmm. you are guess yeah. what like your life matters to god until yes. he tells me otherwise yeah and so they're like oh you christians are assholes right mm-hmm. you're full, you know this it's like yeah. like actually i kind of am an asshole so yeah. you're right there <laughs> however <laughs> you're, you're wrong in the sense that i'm so, i'm somehow you know looking at you like you're some sort of demoralized right. degenerate right. that has no right. chance of redemption yeah right. So I'm, I'm, but the, I'm fighting from a footing yeah. that honestly, they're blind to. And everyone understands yeah. spiritual blindness, right? Like yeah. the enemy, God has even allowed them to be blinded. The yeah. enemy has blinded them. Yeah. And so what is it? We can't evangelize to a blind person that's deaf. Yeah, that's what good. do you have to do? We actually might have to exercise demons. Yeah. We actually might have to deliver people and drive them out. Show of hands in this room. On a daily basis, who asks God for someone to deliver? On a daily basis, who wakes up and asks God, do I have permission to deliver someone today? Will you show me someone that is plagued? My man. I got one hand in the Gangster. Sorry, recently, so I don't know if that counts. That, that totally counts. counts. That counts. That totally counts. That totally counts. counts. <laughs> Phil, look at you back there. Like, I know. Oh, it's like, Warrior oh, Silva, come on. Oh, God. I'm a, uh, you know, long time <laughs> listener, first time caller type of thing. <laughs> <laughs> but like here's here's the whole point praise god right and and i'm not this isn't to like out you guys as you're not doing enough it's it's like what are you driving at are you driving just be like oh, i'm just gonna be like a good church person listen god loves his church god loves you god doesn't need you to be a good church person yeah the whole nation the whole world is freaking full of good church people right check the box check the box yeah. <laughs> it's like and then laying down right in Laying down black water, how many? Like you said numbers. Yeah. He was like, no, we need this many. Yeah. 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 How many men of Gideon's do we have? Yeah. 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 Yeah
of the board members that were World War II vets. They left the marketplace, they left the corporate arena. And so all of a sudden you had corporate rating, you had like, you know, the, 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 the younglings that had no regard for hard fought wins. Mm. They, they, didn't, they didn't regard it. And so all of a sudden you see corporate degeneracy and you, you see corporatism rise. I'm not trying to say like, let's look at all these exterior things. We still have to say, where were the men? Where were the churches, mm-hmm. right? And then you had church scandals, you had all these things. People put pastors up on way too high of a pedestal because they kind of yeah. just walked away from their own authority and responsibility. Yep. 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 And it's, it's not a bad thing. So this isn't like the crap on the church or the crap on pastors. Men of God have to, honestly get back into the church because the pastors need someone to brush up against. They need some help. Well, let, I mean, so let's, let's talk about that because what you're, what you're going into is because we are, we're such a consumer driven culture. So what do we got? We've got a, but you get asked who you, who you listening to, who you consuming? Why is that the question? I mean, why, why is that? That's the go-to is like what podcast, send me some podcasts. How about you just go get in the word? Like, why don't you just spend time exercising the fact that he gave you that righteous anger for a reason? Go scream your lungs off, yelling at God for an hour. Watch what happens. Like, watch what, what starts to work in your life after you actually start to exercise that. And, and I believe that that is what filters down to the church because we are called to step into an assignment mm-hmm. and we are called to plant ourselves in a local church because we are called to protect pastors. We yeah. have put pastors on a, on a pedestal and said, feed me, yeah. feed me. I don't wanna do anything all week, except on Sunday, I wanna be entertained. Entertain me. And if you don't, I'm gonna leave somewhere else because I know you're a businessman and I mean something to you. These are some righteous dollar bills right here. That's it. <laughs> you know how many people I know? I, and, and that's what we've done instead of, how are you stepping up into the protection? How are we how are we allowing pastors to be the counselor, the vision caster, the person that God has put in a specific place for a specific reason, not to run all these 18 different departments within the, the church consumer business. They are supposed to cast the vision for the assignment specifically that God called them to. So how are we protecting them? How are we actually being Gideon's men and actually carrying out the assignment. Mm-hmm. Well, and I, I, just as a point, I, 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 being a pastor, <laughs> I, I excommunicated somebody last um, last winter publicly. Thank wow. God. And um, I don't think, I, I don't have a friend that's ever done that before. I've never been a part of a church that's ever done it. I was praying one morning, like my man Stephen here up early, hitting it hard, <laughs> praying, spending some significant time in prayer. And... I was, I don't know what I was praying for, something random, me probably, you know, mm. and I just heard inside of my, inside, in my, in my inner voice, the spirit of God inside of me, this guy is having sex with a bunch of people in your church. I was like, uh, okay. I felt the Lord said, I want you to call, get on a phone with an elder and call him to this morning now. And I'm like, ah, man. <laughs> so I, so I call the elder up immediately. It's like, I, it's five 30 in the morning. And I go, wait till I, I text the other guy. I, I get on the phone. I don't tell him God said, said this to me. I said, I have a very strong feeling that you're walking in sexual immorality with young ladies in our church. He starts laughing at me, laughing out loud. Ha ha ha, what a joke. What a joke. And I <laughs> snap a little bit. And, uh, <laughs> and he, you know, and then literally three weeks later, he was at a church event and he came and hammered, started putting his hands on girls. And I find out the next day that he'd been sleeping with, a, with he'd been pursuing a bunch of girls in the church. I called him, that, I called him that day. I said, meet me in my office. I said, I'm bringing this in front of the whole church tomorrow, Sunday. And he's like, I'm never coming back. I said, great. That was the plan actually, excommunication. That's what excommunication is. Until you repent and are restored, you're gone. Mm-hmm. And uh, he wept and said he's sor- sorry like a thousand times. And I'm like, listen, man, I don't care if you're sorry. I confronted you personally. Then I brought you before an elder. Now I'm bringing you before a church. I'm obeying God's order, oh, his yeah. word. Yeah. And I went in front of the church and um, did the thing. After the service, because uh, it was on a Sunday, something we don't do on Sundays, uh, is discipline people. It's one of the reasons we have a weak church. No, it's about to... Weak, weak people are grown without discipline, right? Oh like yeah. Weak That's brats, exactly the rod, right. Right. The rod. Diabetic it's kids evil. with, yeah. with Twizzlers coming out of their nose. Don't get yeah. disciplined. And, uh, after the, after 
I probably had five, maybe 10 people come up to me and say, thank you so much. Yeah, come on. Mm -hmm. I've they never felt, felt so safe before. Yep. Yeah, yep. Cause, yep. Craving it. Because we craving, need yep. somebody, we need somebody in our life that's willing to crack us Draw when we're not doing it right. Draw a line, and I don't man. do it right sometimes. Yeah. And I run my mouth too much and I'm a tough guy sometimes. And my, my pastor will call me and be like, is that the Lord or is that you? I'm like, I think it's the Lord. Maybe. Let me check again. <laughs> Let me go back. <laughs> yeah, I'll get back to you. I'll get back to you. Yeah. All right. That officially wraps up episode one of Jesus and Beers at a time when kings went off to war. I'd like to once again thank David Engelhart, Byron Rogers, Kenny Stivers. I'd like to thank John Fowler from Security Gun Club, King's Church, Lucid News, Protector Nation, Bravo Research Group, Team Nelson, G9 Ammo, Genesis Arms, 1776 Nutrition, Vets for Child Rescue. Thank you for everyone that sponsored. Thank you that supported. There's a list of people within the B-roll that were there at the event, as well as have contributed over... The years. Listen, this is a long time in the making, so I pray that you were blessed and edified. I pray that the Holy Spirit spoke to you. I pray that you even host your own Jesus and Beers gatherings. Don't charge money. I'm actually encouraging people to gather as men under the banner of Jesus and Beers. But listen, you don't have to drink. This is a time where you have to discuss as men, fatherhood, manhood, all the things that are afflicting your community. You have to do it openly, honestly. God has to be at the center of this. This is the only way that this works. If you're out there and you're struggling with faith or you are backslidden and you want to repent and accept Christ in the name of Jesus. I pray for your forgiveness. I pray for your redemption and restoration. I pray that the spirit of grace and supplication visit you and that you feel the full weight of the cross and your heart changes instead of a heart of stone that God give you a softer heart that can receive the word of God. Thank you for your time and effort. Thank you for watching. Thank you for visiting our sponsors. If you have a heart to contribute, all this ministry is self-funded. So it's our way to honor the other people who have generously contributed over the years, and especially to these events. Listen, the next Jesus and Beers that we're planning is probably just south of 40,000 bucks. And and it's going to be in the Dallas area, and there's more events after that, but this one's going to be a pretty good one. If you have any heart to contribute, the information is on the website. It might even be shown on the screen right here. And listen, God bless you. We're still going to give the message exactly as the Holy Spirit leads. If it's His will, it's His bill. And ours is just the work of obedience. So thank you for watching. Next episode's coming soon. God bless, Godspeed, get in the Word, get in prayer, and get in the fight. In Jesus' name. See ya.